Hello and welcome from the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences, where we've just discovered who has received the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry. Joining me to discuss this prize in more detail is Professor Lars Telanda. Professor Telanda, thank you very much for agreeing to talk about the prize so soon after the announcement has been made. Yeah. Could we begin by you telling us who has received the 2008 Nobel Prize in Chemistry? Well, it's, uh, uh, it's given to Shimomura, Chalfi and Chen for their discovery and improvement of the green fluorescent protein GFP. And so the green fluorescent protein or GFP has been described in the, the announcement as, as an achievement that has a similar impact on science that the microscope has had. Could well, you describe why that's so? Yes. The, the great thing with GFP is that it is a tool that makes it possible to study metabolism and reactions inside a living cell without destroying. You know, the classical way for biochemistry was to crush the cell, extract it, put it into a test tube and try to find out different uh, reactions and so on. But now you can label your protein of interest very easily. Any student can do that. And then you can study what happens to the protein inside the living cell when the cell is born, when it divides, when it metabolizes and so on. And that is a very good precision. You can look at the individual molecules. And that has completely changed the field of biomedicine. So this is a, a fluorescent tag or a marker that you can put on any protein you're particularly interested in and yeah. track its movement through cells over time through the course of, a, of an organism. Yes, right. right. And so th th this has obviously um, expanded the world of, that we can see in, right. it, within cells. Could you give us an example of what we can now see thanks to GFP? Well, they showed in the introduction here, for example, what happens when HIV viruses infect a cell and when the cell starts to produce new virus, because you can label the code protein of the virus with GFP, and then you infect the cell. And you can see first how the cell is diffusely green. But then with time you see small, very green spots that assemble throughout the cell and that the new viruses that form. And you can then in real time follow how fast they are built and how this assembly is made. And then of course you can start to understand how you could interfere with this assembly also in a more detail than we could ever do before. Yes. So the, so this has opened up a new world for, for sure. yeah, scientists you can see worldwide. That if you follow the scientific literature in the last 10 years or something, it just exploded. Every second paper has screen fluorescent protein or something similar in it as a method. Yes. So the, the prize itself was, was awarded to, to three researchers who were involved in different stages in the discovery and development of GFP. If we could, could we go through each one in turn, please, and discuss the key discoveries behind all of them? Yeah. So if we start at the person who actually discovered GFP in the first yeah. place. That was the Japanese Shimomura, and he was basically he was a marine biologist, and he was interested in bioluminescence, and that's a reaction where you can create light without heat. It's a chemical reaction that gives off light, and you can see it in, in uh, different uh, uh, fireflies, for example. You can see it in, in uh, lots of animals living in the sea. You can see how they flourish if you go out at night. They use it to signal between each other. And he was interested to know exactly what controlled this reaction and, and the chemical background for it. So he started to isolate, he started to collect this uh, manet, this Aquaria uh, Victoria, it's just a jellyfish. Yes. So he collected hundreds and hundreds of these jellyfish in the Friday Harbor at the, the west coast of America. And then they cut out the light organs that are in the sur at the borders of the jellyfish and collected lots and lots of these and extracted them and purified the enzyme that was responsible for the, for the light emission. And then he could show that if you look at the sea, you can see that the, the jellyfish has a green fluorescent light. But when you isolated this uh, bioluminescent enzyme, you got the blue light. So obviously something was missing. And then he looked again and he found this green fluorescent protein that transfers the blue light into green light. And that must be an advantage for the jellyfish. Maybe you can see them in longer distance. You can tell it apart from other fishes or something like this. And then, after, so, so he really isolated the green fluorescent protein, made the amino sequence, amino acid sequence of it, and he also identified the chromophore, which is three amino acids inside sort of a barrel, and then for the chromophore that makes a green fluorescent light when you irradiate it with blue light. So that was his part of it. So, so Professor Shimomura 
discovered the protein that, that glows yes. in jellyfish. The right. next step was described as eureka moment yeah. in the announcement. Then, of course, nothing happened for a while because people assume from other systems that to get the green fluorescent protein fluorescent, you need some other enzyme systems to create the chromophore because there are lots of similar systems known earlier. So then they clone this gene for the green fluorescent protein was a guy who did that and he tried to express it but he saw no fluorescent and that was his expectation he thought well of course it wouldn't work because you need some other enzyme also from from the jellyfish to get it fluorescent so it stopped at that level for a while but then came in a guy who that is Chalfina who was interested in elegance this uh, nematode that is a model system for nerve development and so on. It's a one millimeter long organism. And he was very interested to have a reporter for gene expression. And he had heard about this green fluorescent protein. He thought, well, well, let's try. So he had a rotation student, very, you know, she didn't know anything, but she got this gene and expressed it. And sure, immediately saw that it formed a green fluorescent light. And he tried, she tried both in E. coli bacteria and in the nematode. And in both cases, it fluoresced. And of course, they draw the conclusion and publish, which is very important, that you don't need anything else. You only need this protein. It forms the chromophore itself. And that was completely unheard of. So that was the revolution. So, so, the, so the key to this was the, the GFP by itself glowed without, yes, the, without it the, the assistance of other proteins. it could form this chromophore by itself, yeah. and that was completely new. And then, and, and the other important thing was that you could actually take take this this fluorescent protein, put it into other organisms, yes. switch on the genes for it to create the proteins, yeah. and it still would grow. And then the protein forms this barrier, and the chromophore by itself it only needs oxygen. So you have to have in organisms which use oxygen, but most organisms. Right. So that's the only. And then you form this form. And so, and, and that of course, when people heard about that, that spread around and so on. Well, so this is great. But then come in Chen, who was the one that made it to a, a useful tool because it was still rather primitive. It wasn't very bright and it wasn't very stable and so on. But he made mutations in it and, and developed it into a very good tool that anybody can use. And he also expanded the colors, you know. It was the only green from the beginning. Now you have all the ways from blue to red. And that's important when you want to study many proteins at the same time in a cell. You can have one red, one blue, one green and so on. And then you can see how they interact during the cell life because you can follow them. And in neurons you can see how these different nerve cells one sends out the green spot, sprout and one a red one and how they interconnect and so on. So it's immensely important. And so and what, what this allowed pe people to do is to, to work on different organisms, um, work on different tissues, right. analyze the sort of a very complex level of protein expression, see where exactly. proteins are at different space and time. Yeah. And, 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 and so, so where are we now with, with these, these proteins? What, what, what can we see? Well, I mean, lots of, of optic methods that were invented during the 1980s and so on, they couldn't really be used because nobody knew how to make good fluorescent markers in by the cell. Now, of course, they have been revived and there are many fancy names on this, but you can measure distances between proteins. You can, you can shine light on them so you can sort of put one fluorescent off and you start another fluorescent. So you have very good possibilities to follow process in the cell, both in time and in space, and see exactly what happens when the cell is metabolizing, dying, living, and so on. And that is very powerful. So what, what's happened is we've, we've, we've moved over 40 years from someone who's looking at a very basic curiosity, like how, how do jellyfish glow, exactly. to, a, to a biomedical revolution and right. even a Nobel Prize. And of course, nobody could have said that earlier, but, but now right. it's, it's a very good tool. And you know, it gets more and more fashion now to look at single molecules. Early we could use, because if you, you have low signals, you have to have many molecules to see, and then you get averages. But now when you can label your favorite protein begin fresh, well, you can study one molecule at a time, and then you can really understand how an enzyme works. And you don't just see the mean of 100 enzymes, you see exactly what happens, what comes up and goes down. And, and how genes are put on and off and things like this. And you can see how things work normally, but also how things work in disease, for example. Yeah, sure. And then you can compare disease and, you know, different metabolic states and when the cell divides and all these sort of things. You can see in one single molecule, what does this molecule do? And this is great.